So if you will, feel free to turn back in your Bibles to Daniel if you will. I figured I'll just show all the points right now so I don't have to keep going down and moving my little pad of paper around for each point. But the title of the message, the title of the Bible lesson today is God is in control, the message of Daniel. God is sovereign. And I know oftentimes from our perspective, it doesn't look like God is in control. We say to ourselves, well, why is there so much evil? Why is there so much opposition against God and the plans and the purposes of God? But God is allowing all these things to take place. Perhaps God wants us as human beings to get a full dose of how bad off we are without him. So the people will want something better, and they will seek their creator and worship him. So I'd like to go through the first seven chapters of Daniel and just kind of survey them briefly to see how God is exalted as the sovereign God over the affairs of his people, over the affairs of the government of Babylon. Nothing is hidden from God, nothing escapes the notice of God, and nothing is out from underneath the plans and the purposes of God. So Daniel was written about the 6th century B.C., that would be the 500s B.C., and Daniel begins with a reference to King Nebuchadnezzar hauling away some of the Jews into captivity. That would be about 605 B.C. And so let's start with number one. So in chapter one, Daniel finds himself in Babylon. Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, are there as well. And God gives these four Jewish men great favor in the eyes of the king. God, in his sovereignty, has allowed these four men to go to Babylon. God has given them great wisdom and learning and understanding and all that they were taught and then the day comes when they must appear before the king of Babylon, mighty King Nebuchadnezzar. And the text tells us that God, God caused these four men to find favor in the eyes of the king. So what I'm saying is this. God is sovereign not only in the promised land, but even as his people are expelled from the promised land and they go into Babylon and they have to serve a pagan king, and live under a pagan regime. God is still sovereign there. And that's an encouragement to God's people. So let's read about this now. Uh, number one, notice chapter one, verses eight to nine. Chapter one, verses eight to nine. So here's Daniel now in Babylon. He's at the king's court. Daniel chapter one, verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now notice verse 9. Now God, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. So who is it that brought Daniel into favor with the chief of the eunuchs? It's God. You see, God is over Daniel's life. And even though Daniel doesn't have the privilege and the pleasure of living back in the promised land, because he was taken away by King Nebuchadnezzar, God is still with Daniel. And no matter where we go or what circumstances we find ourselves in, God is still with us. God is with us everywhere. And then, if you will, notice the end of the chapter, verse 17. As you know the story, Daniel requested to eat only vegetables. He didn't want the king's delicacies. So the chief of the eunuchs was a little hesitant at first. He didn't want his neck on the line or his life on the chopping block, if you know what I'm saying. So he said to Daniel, Daniel, I'll give you a trial period of 10 days, and we'll, we'll take it from there. We'll see how things look at the, after the end of the 10 days in this special diet. So the chief of the eunuch was amazed. Daniel and his friends looked better than all the others. So he said, okay, keep on your diet. So the day comes when Daniel and his friends have to stand before King Nebuchadnezzar. This is what we read, verse 17. As for these four young men, God, God gave them knowledge. Notice that. Now, who gave them the knowledge? God gave them knowledge and skill in all 
literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of days, when the king had said that they should brought, be brought uh, in, uh, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them. And among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. So who did all of this? Who gave Daniel and his three friends that special gift of understanding and wisdom and knowledge? God did. Who brought them before the court of King Nebuchadnezzar? God did. Who gave them favor in the eyes of the king so that the king appointed them to important positions in his realm? God did. God is sovereign over their lives. God is sovereign over our lives. All right, number two, God orders the future. So now we'll look at chapter two. Well, in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a very, a very terrifying dream. It upset him. In fact, the dream upset him so much so that King Nebuchadnezzar said to all of his magicians and astrologers and all the Chaldeans and all the wise men, the king said, you tell me the dream. Tell me what I dreamed last night, and then I know you'll be able to tell me the interpretation. And if you can't tell me the dream, I'm going to kill you all. So, of course, the magicians, the astrologers, and the Chaldeans, and all the wise men, they're all upset. They're saying, okay, this is impossible. Nobody can do this. Only the gods can tell you this. So word went out, and Daniel was informed. So Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they all prayed to God. They said, God, you know, our lives are on the line. We're going to be killed. So this is a pressing matter. Plus, we'd like to help out the king. He's kind of upset. So they prayed to God. And God was pleased to reveal the dream to Daniel and its interpretation. Again, God is sovereign. God is guiding uh, the whole affair. While the king is very angry, he's acting very rashly, very rudely, God is still in charge. And God is working things out to protect Daniel and his three friends and also to inform this king something he needs to learn. So let's notice, if you will, chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. I hope you can see that good. Chapter 2, verse 17. So this is where Daniel and his three friends are informed of the problem, and then uh, God reveals to them the dream and its meaning. So verse 17. This is chapter 2 now, verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision, or in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons, he removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And then in verse 23, Daniel offers praise to God. Daniel says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. So Daniel gives thanks to God because God is the one who revealed the matter to Daniel. So if you will notice verse 27. Now Daniel is brought before the king. And he's going to explain the dream and its meaning. So notice how Daniel begins. Notice uh, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. 
your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And so though Daniel goes and explains the dream. The king saw in his dream a great big statue, statue of a man. The head was gold. The chest and the arms were silver. Uh, the stomach and the thighs were bronze. And the lower extremities and the feet were uh, iron, iron and clay. The feet would be iron and clay. And so in this dream, the king is informed that there will be a succession of kingdoms. The head is the head of gold. King Nebuchadnezzar has the mightiest empire at the moment. And there'll be a succession of kingdoms that will become inferior. Then at the end of the dream, King Nebuchadnezzar saw a rock, a rock cut out of the mountain, but not cut out with human hands. It was cut out by God. And that rock was thrown at the feet of this statue, the feet that were iron and clay. And the feet broke. The feet were crushed. And the whole thing came tumbling down. And so what Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to learn from this is God is the one who is in control of history. God is the one who is in control of the succession of kingdoms. And as we'll read, notice uh, verses uh, 36 to 38. We'll start there. Uh, it made known to the king here. Let's just notice verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So who has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory to King Nebuchadnezzar? God did. See, Nebuchadnezzar thinks he got all this for himself. He thinks he's so powerful. He probably even thinks that he's a god. But Daniel is trying to inform the king by explaining the dream that God rules even over King Nebuchadnezzar. So then, if you will, let's just uh, go down to verse 44 now. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. See, God will set up a kingdom. God is in charge. God rules. God is sovereign. God of heaven. He will set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as, uh, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. There's coming a kingdom. God will bring in this kingdom, and it will remain forever and ever and ever. I would like to suggest that this kingdom has already been inaugurated. This kingdom has already been started. When Jesus came, he set up a kingdom. Oh, it's not here in full force. We still have to wait for the second coming of Jesus for that kingdom to, to spread and reach its full power and full development. But God has set up a kingdom. And I just made some cross-references here. Let me just refer to Mark. Mark chapter 1 for a moment. Uh, John was put in prison, as we read there. And then Jesus came preaching. And what did Jesus say? He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And then in the gospel of Luke chapter 1, we read these words spoken to Mary by the angel Gabriel. Jesus will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You see, there's a kingdom coming. God is going to order it. It's already begun. It's not here in full force yet. So God orders the future. God is the one that directs the course and the current of human history. All right, let's go down to number three. Let me just slide this up a little bit for you. Let's go down to number three. So this will be chapter three. Chapter 3. God saves from the king's fire. Well, you know the story. The king set up a great big statue down on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. And the king called all of his administration to be present. All of his royal officials of every rank. And when the music played and the trumpet sounded, everybody was supposed to bow down before this statue. So I suppose the king wants to... Uh, cement allegiance and loyalty under him. The king wants uh, no division in the empire. 
Uh, the king wants uh, conformity. He wants everyone to conform to what he wants. He wants to rally everybody under his allegiance. Or he wants everybody to rally under his power. He wants the allegiance of everybody. Well, there were three Jews that were caught, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And when the music played and the trumpet sounded, they didn't bow down. And so they were apprehended by others. They were brought before the king. King, didn't you say if people don't bow down, they're going to be thrown into the fire? And the king had to say, yes, they'll be thrown into the fire. And these uh, three men, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they stand before the king, and they just flat out tell the king, our God is able to deliver us. The God in whom we believe is able to deliver us from you and your edict and your fire. Now, why did... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah say that because they believed that God was sovereign. God was in control of this whole situation. It wasn't King Nebuchadnezzar that was in control. God is in control. And so they flat out told the king, even if our God chooses not to save us from your fire, we're not going to bow down. That's all there is to it. And that made the king get all the more angry. Boy, he was livid. So he had his best soldiers in the army confiscate these three men, he heated the fire up seven times hotter. The men that threw these three men in were killed because the fire was so hot. And then the king has to remember, wow, I see four people standing in the fire walking around. And one is like one of the sons of the gods. And the king was just amazed. And they came out. Not even a singe, not even a singe on their clothing. God is sovereign over the king, over the king's anger, over the king's temper tantrum and over the king's fire. God is the one who decides whether Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah live or die. Well, let's read about this. I just put one reference here. Uh, notice uh, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. This is when uh, these three men confront the king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it is the case that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods. No, we worship the gold image which you have set up. And then if you will, notice verse 28. 28, at the end of the chapter, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That were their Babylonian names who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Wow. God is sovereign over the king and his fire. And Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they believed in a sovereign god. All right, in chapter 4, in chapter 4, God humbles a king. So the king has another dream. And he's all upset and he's all disturbed by the dream. And of course he calls for Daniel. Because Daniel can interpret the king's dreams. So in this dream, the king sees a great big tree. A great big tree that's flourishing and prospering. It's just a big, huge tree that's doing quite well. And it provides shade and shelter and sustenance to everyone in the king's realm. The tree gets chopped down. And Daniel has to now go inform the king that this dream is about him. He is going to get chopped down, as it were. He's going to be run out of his kingdom. He's going to be deposed from serving as king. And Daniel gave some admonition to the king. He said, king, oh king, I repent of your sins and start showing kindness to the poor. Start doing good. The king had 12 months. And then after 12 months, imagine, that's the mercy of God. God gave him 12 months before he did this. But after 12 months, he was run out of his kingdom. Perhaps we don't know, but perhaps the king had uh, a case of insanity. Something happened to him. God caused him to be deranged in his mind. He went out and lived like an animal. And so Nebuchadnezzar finally, after seven years, he finally lifted up his head. He lifted up his eyes. He acknowledged God to be supreme. And his reason returned to him. And then we have this wonderful confession that we read for our scripture reading. Notice once again, if you will, verse 28. This is chapter 4, verse 28. 
So all this, all this that uh, Daniel uh, mentioned as far as the interpretation of his dream, all this came upon the king. So at the end of 12 months, he was walking about his royal palace of Babylon, and the king was gloating over his power, over his majesty, gloating over all of his works. He was gloating over everything he had done. And the king was a very proud and arrogant man. And then notice verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, in other words, while the king was still speaking and gloating over all his accomplishments and boasting in his works, a voice fell from heaven. In other words, a voice came from God. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. In other words, you're not going to reign as king anymore. And they'll drive you out. And so we know the story. He lived like an animal for seven years. And then in verse 35, he acknowledges God. His reason returns to him. And he confesses that God is the one who rules over all, and he gives praise to God. He learned a hard lesson, but he had to learn it the hard way. And I think the whole story tells us about God's mercy. God was merciful in allowing the king to have this dream, having Daniel interpret it for him, to go through these seven years, to come out of it alive. And now he believes in the supremacy and the sovereignty of God and gives God praise. All right, number five, God deposes a king. In fact, it's even worse than that. Not only does God depose a king, but he terminates a king. This king is killed. So now we meet Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar knew all the things that happened to his father, Nebuchadnezzar. He knew how God humbled him. He knew what God did. He knew how his father finally came around and confessed the supremacy and the sovereignty of God in heaven. But he didn't repent. He didn't change one bit. So let's read about this now. This is uh, chapter 5, if you will. Chapter 5, and notice verse 20. And you know how he was having a great big feast. And all of his uh, officials were there, his wives, his concubines. And they brought out all the utensils from the uh, temple in Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar has taken. And they were really having a great party, engaging in great revelry. And then all of a sudden, the, the hand of a man appeared. And the finger started to write something on the wall. And the king's knees were shaking together. So then he had to call for Daniel. Good thing for Daniel. Daniel comes, and Daniel explains everything. So now we pick it up at verse 20. I just thought you needed that little introduction there. Notice verse 20. So this is Daniel speaking to Belshazzar, the king. Verse 20. But when his heart, that is the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he, that is God, deposed him uh, from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he, that is Nebuchadnezzar, was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made uh, like the beast, and, the, and, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints it over whomever he chooses. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines, you have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see, nor hear, or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. So God's judgment is pronounced against Belshazzar. He did not humble himself. He did not acknowledge the God of heaven. And so that very night, he was killed. And Darius the Mede comes to power as the ruler over the kingdom of Babylon. So who allowed Belshazzar to be king? God did. Who took Belshazzar out of office and terminated him? God did. It was all God's plan. Let's go to number six. Let me just slide this up. Number six. And so we'll go to chapter six. Chapter 6. So God saves from the lions. Remember faithful Daniel? God put him there in the court of the kings of Babylon. Now he's serving at the court of Darius the Mede. 
And uh, Daniel's uh, fellow administrators didn't like the fact that Daniel was so popular with the king. He didn't like all the favor and the accolades he received from the king. So Daniel's uh, fellow administrators became jealous and envious of Daniel. And they noticed that Daniel would open his window towards the temple in Jerusalem, and he would pray three times a day. And so they thought, well, let's, let's get the king. Let's make the king. Let's encourage the king to pass a law that nobody can pray to anyone except you, O king. And if they do, there's going to be consequences. They'll be thrown into the lion's den. And so I suppose the king went along. It sort of bolstered everybody giving his, their allegiance to the king. It would sort of cement the empire together under his rule. So the king went along. And then they brought Daniel before the king. King, di didn't you say? Everybody's going to pray to you and nobody but you for 30 days. And here's Daniel. He's praying to his own God three times a day. And the king was rather distraught. He regretted the fact that he ever went along with this uh, proposal by these uh, conspirators who were plotting against Daniel. But nevertheless, the king felt his word had to stand, otherwise he'd look weak. So you know the story. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. So who was sovereign over those lions? Who was sovereign over the lion's den? Who was sovereign over all those people who conspired to get rid of Daniel and get him in trouble with the king? Who was sovereign over the king? Who's sovereign over the king's edict? Who was going to decide whether Daniel lives or dies? God. God will decide. Not the king. Not the conspirators. Not even the lions. And I'm sure the lions were hungry. <laughs> but it was God. Well, let's just read about this now. This is uh, Daniel uh, chapter 6. Notice chapter 6, verse 18. Chapter 6, verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also a sleep went from him. Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions, so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den so Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury was found on him because he believed in his God. And Daniel believed in a God who was sovereign over all his circumstances. And then, of course, the king had to write a new decree, a new statement. This is verse 25. Then King Darius wrote, uh, to all, this is verse 25, to all peoples, nations, and languages who dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Wow. Wow. All these kings are learning something about God through Daniel and his friends. Well, one final reference. Uh, this will be in chapter 7. So we get to chapter 7. And uh, this is in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. And uh, Daniel had a dream. So now Daniel has a dream, and he's going to explain his dreams. He had a dream of beasts coming up out of the ocean, coming up out of the sea. And these uh, various beasts coming up out of the ocean represent the succession of various kings. And in the midst of this uh, uh, dream of seeing beasts representing kings, uh, having successive kingdoms, and even oppressing God's people, Daniel has a vision of God sitting on his throne. And this is very amazing because it relates to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So notice, if you will, chapter 7, verse 9. Chapter 7, verse 9. This is what Daniel saw in his dream. 
So chapter 7, verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. The Ancient of Days is God. God is the one who is the Ancient of Days. He's the everlasting person. Always was, always is, always will be. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated, the books were open. So it's God, it's a picture of God as it were, sitting in his throne. Thousands and thousands of angels before the throne of God. It's a picture of God's awesome power and his supremacy over all the universe. Then we get down to verse 13. This uh, God, this theme or this uh, vision of God sitting on his throne continues. Verse 13. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So the Son of Man is brought before the Ancient of Days. Verse 14. Then to him, that is to the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Again, that's a reference to the coming of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom, which will be an everlasting kingdom. I would submit to you that it's already begun, but it's not here in full force or full effect yet. And a mindful of what uh, Jesus says in uh, Matthew uh, chapter uh, 26, I believe it is. 26, yes, I have 26 written down. That 64 on there. Yeah, Matthew 26, 64. So remember how Jesus is standing for the high priest? Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus has to answer the high priest. And Jesus says to the high priest, it is as you say. In other words, the high priest was asking you, are you, are you the son of God? So Jesus responds and says, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Yes, Daniel chapter 7 is talking about Jesus and the future coming of Jesus Christ to rule and reign in this world. Well, God is sovereign. And I think we all need to realize that whoever sits in the White House and whoever sits in the Oval Office is ordained by God. God is the one who ultimately decides who sits in the Oval Office. Based on what we've read, I think we can make that application. It doesn't mean we shouldn't go out and vote. It doesn't mean we shouldn't go do our civic duty. We certainly should. These are blessings we enjoy. But as we've learned from Daniel, God sets up kings, God takes kings down. All is under God's authority. So let me just make a few uh, applications by way of closing. I think when we read about the sovereignty and the supremacy of God in Scripture, we should all be humble. And we should all want to submit to this great and awesome God. He alone is worthy of our service and our obedience. And then, too, I think we find a great sense of comfort. So many things in this world seem out of control. There is so much uh, sentiment uh, against God. There is so much defiance of his plan and his purposes. Whether it's the, the rank and file people in our community, whether it's government officials, there's so much that's going on that's against God. And yet we find comfort to know that God is still in control. God is still sovereign. And then I think we're moved to trust in God more. You remember uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as they were contemplating being thrown into that fiery furnace? They confessed their faith in God. And I'm sure as Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, Daniel, if not verbally out loud, at least in his own heart, he was reaffirming his faith and his trust in God. Daniel realized his life was in the hands of God. And that's the best place and the best person to have our lives being held in his hands. So I trust we'll all be encouraged this morning. Things aren't spinning out of control. No matter what happens in Washington to what happens across America or around the world, no matter what happens in your personal life, God is still in control. And he's the great God worth serving. That's the God we love. That's the God who was merciful. That's the God who sent Jesus to save us from our sins, to bring us into fellowship with him, 
because God loves and enjoys our fellowship. Well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to meditate on your word this morning. And I pray that we might all be encouraged and refreshed and revitalized in our faith in you, knowing that you are the sovereign and supreme God who rules over all. Lord, build up our faith and our confidence in you. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus, the one who is coming back to rule and reign in this world as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>